This program is made possible by the Ralph's Company Foundation and the Maryland Humanities Council. <laughs> Roland Flint and Michael S. Harper celebrating Sterling Brown. Welcome to The Writing Life. We have the great good fortune today to be able to spend some time with the distinguished American poet, Michael Harper. Mr. Harper directs the writing program at Brown University. He has published eight volumes of poetry and some anthologies as well. He is the uh, Poet Laureate of the state of Rhode Island. Nice to have you here, Michael. Nice to see nice you. Nice to be here. Mr. Harper is here in Howard County as the main speaker in a program to honor Sterling Allen Brown on what would have been Brown's 93rd birthday, May 1st, 1994. Sterling Brown was, of course, a great poet, a professor, a scholar of American culture, and an, uh, and an anthologist who taught for more than 40 years at Howard University in Washington, D.C., and whose students include um, uh, Lucille Clifton, uh, Marie Baraka, Shirley Ann Williams, Toni Morrison, and many, many more. Uh, Mr. Harper was not a uh, Brown student, but we'll hear something about how they came to be friends, which they were for many, many years. When Brown's uh, collected poems was published in 1980, he finally received the national recognition that had been lacking before that time. It was in the National Poetry Series, and it was selected, it was edited, and selected by Michael Harper. It was widely praised and won various awards, including the Lenore Marshall Award. And Philip Levine, one of the judges, wrote, the collected poems of Sterling Allen Brown is a great book of poems, stunning in its artistry and gigantic in its vision. Brown has been able to capture the daily reality and the mythic dimensions of a people who, until these poems were made, had not entered our poetry and he has done it with clarity, economy, and tact. His voice is so large and authentic, it is capable of containing not only the extraordinary variety of American black voices, but those of northern and southern whites as well. Um, well, <clears throat> we're going to talk with Michael Harper, and he's going to read some of uh, Sterling Brown's poems and perhaps some of his own. Um, you were not his student, um, Michael, but you, but you met him in 1972, I believe. Tell us about that. I met him in New York City, uh, October 1972. He was there to receive uh, a lifetime award from the Black Academy of Arts and Letters. And I was there to receive uh, an award for a second book of poems I wrote called History is Your Own Heartbeat. And Ernest Gaines was there to receive the award for his novel, the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman. And the three of us were seated at the t same table. And so he introduced himself as the invisible Mr. Brown. And I took offense at that and said I knew about him by reputation over many years and that he had taught some of my relatives. And uh, I gave him a kind of recitation of his bibliography. I told him about the Negro Caravan. I told him about the Negro in American fiction. I told him about Southern Road. And then, um, he said, well, what are you going to do about that tuxedo you're wearing? Of course, I was not wearing one, and neither was he. But he was a great punster. And I told him that we were going to get even with him when we came to Washington for a conference that the Library of Congress was holding in January 1973. And Gaines and I called him on the telephone. He said, come right over. So we did. Over to Kearney Street. Come over to Kearney Street. Come right over. <laughs> And uh, we came over, and uh, he held court, and then we invited him to, um, I invited him to Brown University, not only to read his poetry, but also to give a lecture, Images and Reality. And that night, Gaines and I flew back to Providence, and Gaines dedicated his reading, which was from Bloodline. He read a story called Just Like a Tree to Sterling Brown. So um, Sterling was... Um, to anybody who had any sense about American literature. He was called the Dean of Afro-American Literature. But most people forget that uh, Sterling was a uh, consummate teacher. And 
he was a specialist on Twain, on Melville, on 18th century drama, on Renaissance, on, he read uh, Goethe in the original and his commentary in the Reader's Guide to World Literature involves uh, essays on Frost, on Lincoln, on uh, Goethe, on Baudelaire. The man was uh, a Renaissance man. What did you say his four H's were? Four H's. On his uh, 80th birthday, which he celebrated at Brown University, Homer, Heine, Hardy, Hausman. I heard him talk about uh, Hausman sometimes and about <coughs> Robert Frost, too. He said he learned from Frost, and, uh, and he wrote sonnets later that uh, he said were influenced by Robert Frost. Well, Sterling was at Williams College, and he uh, was there on a program called A Son's Return. He had not been back to his undergraduate college in 51 years, and he ended his talk, Oh, Didn't He Ramble, with a recitation of what he said was his favorite Robert Frost poem, which is called In Dive, He's Dive six-line poem that rhymes. It is late at night, and still I am losing, but still I am steady and unaccusing. As long as the declaration, large D, guards my right to be equal in number of cards, it's nothing to me who runs a dive. Let's have a look at another five. <laughs> so he was very much uh, conversant in the frost Oeuvre. That even sounds cold. like a Sterling Brown poem, doesn't it? And How about a Sterling Brown poem? I'd love to read one, but uh, I'd like to read my, the, the poem that I wrote for him uh, and his wife after um, Daisy. I met him, Daisy. It's called Burr Sterling and the Rocker, and it's what I call a folk sonnet. That is to say, it has 14 lines. Any fool knows a Burr in a rocker is a boomerang incarnate. Look at the blade of the rocker that wondrous crescent rocking in harness as poem. To speak of poetry is the curled line straightened. To speak of double talk, the tongue gone pure. The stoic line, a trestle whistling. A man, a train coming on. Listen, Burr Sterling, steel driving man. Folks said, folks saying, that chair's a blues harness star turning on its earthy axis. Miss Daisy, Latch on that star's arc. Hold on, sweet mama. Burr Sterling's rocker glows. Beautiful. Sterling had a, had a, a saying. He said, I got him out of the rocking chair. <laughs> he said, you, <laughs> you, you made me get out of the rocking chair. So he was referring to this poem. Well, I think you did. With the yeah. publication of that book, he began then to uh, give more readings and be invited around the country. I heard him first, I don't know what year, but it was long before that at the Textile Museum. Yes. His yes. former student, the attorney, Timothy Jenkins, introduced him. Of course, him. of course. Uh, Sterling um, always began his readings with um, Odyssey, a big boy. And uh, my son, who is now 25, was four years old, and I was going down to, to meet him. And he asked me where I was going. I said I was going to meet Sterling Brown. And he said, um, how long are you going to be gone? I said, a day or two. And then there was a pause, and he was standing in his pajamas, and he said, let me be with old jazz bow. And he <laughs> papped his finger. Now, this is before he could read. So Sterling had an audience even among children. And he had a presence in your house, obviously. Oh, my, <laughs> didn't he? Odyssey, a big boy. Let me be with Casey Jones. Let me be with Stagger Lee. Let me be with such like men when death takes hold on me. When death takes hold on me. Then skinned as a boy in Kentucky hills, drove steel there as a man. Then stripped tobacco in Virginia fields alongst the River Dan, alongst the River Dan. Then mined the coal in West Virginia, liked that job just fine, till a load of slate curved round my head, won't work in no more mine, won't work in no more mine. Then shocked the corn in Maryland and Georgia done cut cane, then planted rice in South Carolina, but won't do that again do that no more again. Been roused about in Memphis, dockhand in Baltimore, then smashed up freight on the Norfolk wharves, a first-class stevedore, a first-class stevedore. Then slung hash yonder in the north on the old Fall River line, then busted suds in little New York, which ain't no work of mine, Lord, ain't no work of mine. 
slept and worked and loafed on such like jobs, seen what there is to see, then had my time with a pint on my hip and a sweet gal on my knee, sweet mama on my knee. Had stovepipe blonde in Macon, yellow gal in Maryland, in Richmond had a chocolate brown call me her monkey man, her big fool monkey man. Had two fair browns in Arkansas and three in Tennessee. Had Creole gal in New Orleans, sure God did two time me. Lord, four time, two time, four time me. <laughs> but best gal that I ever had, then put it over them, a gal in southwest Washington at four and a half an M, four and a half an M. Then took my living as it came, then grabbed my joy, then risked my life. Trained and caught me on the trestle, man and caught me with his wife, his doggone pretty wife. I didn't had my women, I didn't had my fun. Can't do much complaining when my jag is done, Lord, Lord, my jag is done. And all the big boy axes when time comes for to go. Let me be with John Henry, steel driving man. Let me be with old jazz bow. Let me be with old jazz bow. <laughs> it's wonderful. And, you, and, and as I remember him, you read a, you read a good deal like him. I know well, that's partly <clears throat> deliberate. It's not yes, part of it's deliberate. But part of it is that it, it, uh, Sterling was a tremendous musical poet. And of course, uh, he doesn't call it the journey of big boy. He calls it odyssey of big boy. And he is suggesting that even though this is not classical literature, no one person could do all these things. He's really talking about the efforts of a, a people who had done the world's work. And the part that I love is, had stovepipe blonde in making a stovepipe blonde. <laughs> Yellow gal in Maryland. Oh, my. He had, he had great, uh, great economy, great wit. It also suggests the, uh, the range of his voices. Mm. He uh, loved and wrote uh, movingly in this uh, kind of dialect. And he also wrote, as we said, formal poems in the tradition of Houseman and Frost. Yes. Well, I think he would call, uh, Sterling called it a folk idiom. Folk idiom. And one of the things that uh, I think that people ought to understand is nobody on this earth talked like this. But he suggested a, um, a kind of parlance which was familiar, homey, and had a certain kind of economy, which Sterling greatly admired. Uh, after all, he was trade, trained by um, uh, teachers who had given him the keys to a new literature, George Dutton, for example. At, at, and, but he was also a student of Kittredge, which is to say he studied Shakespeare's plays line by line. So Sterling knew dramaturgy. And of course, he wrote dramatic portraits. He could bring people alive. This is one of his favorite poems, and he claims it's autobiographical. And it's not. It's about Big Boy Davis, but he says it's autobiographical. It's called Long Gone. I likes you kind of loving, ain't never caught you wrong, but it just ain't natural for to stay here long. It just ain't natural for a railroad man with an itch for traveling he can't understand. I looks at the rails, and I looks at the ties, and I hears an old freight puffing up the rise. And at nights on my pallet, when all is still, I listens for the empties, bumping up the hill. When I ought to be quiet, I has got a itch for to hear the whistle blow for the crossing or the switch. And I knows the times are nearing when I got to ride, though it's homelike and happy at your side. You done done all you could do to make me stay. Tain't no fault of yours I was leaving. I was just that away. I has got to see some people I ain't never seen. Got a highball through some country where I never been. I don't know which way I'm traveling, far or near. All I knows for certain is I can't stay here. Ain't no call at all, sweet woman, for to carry on. Just my name and just my habit to be long gone. Uh -huh. He had a great um, sense of story. And of course, Big Boy Davis was the central character in his famous poem, When the Saints Go marching home. Now, when Sterling went back to Harvard, he was sitting in a class on uh, Orpheus and Eurydice, and he wrote this great poem called Slim in Hell. It's in three parts. Slim in Hell. Slim girl went to heaven, and St. Peter said, Slim, you've been a right good boy, and he winked at him. You've been a traveling rascal in your day. You can roam once more, then you comes to stay. Put these wings on your shoulders and save your feet. Slim grin, and he speak up, thank you, Pete. <laughs> then Peter say, go to hell and see all it is doing and report to me. Be sure to remember how everything go. 
Slim say I be seeing you on the late watch, Bo. Slim got to cavort and swell as you choose like Lindy in the spirit of the St. Louis blues. He flew and he flew till at last he hit a hangar with a sign reading, this is it. Then he parked his wings and strolled around, getting used to his feet on the solid ground. Part two. Big bloodhounds come a-roaring like Niagara Falls, sicked on by white devils in overalls. Now Slim wasn't scared, cross my heart ain't so fact, and the dog went on a bay in some poor devil's track. Then Slim saw a mansion and walked right in. The devil looked up with a sickly grin. Certainly didn't look for you, Mr. Greer. How it happens you come to visit here? Slim say, oh, just thought I'd drop by a spell. Feel at home, sir, and here's the keys to hell. Then he took Slim round and showed him people raising hell as high as the first church steeple. Looked lots of folks fighting at the roulette wheel, like old Rampart Street or leastwise Beale. Showed him bawdy houses and cabarets, then thought of New Orleans and Memphis days. Each devil was busy with a devilish broad, and Slim cried, Lordy, Lord, Lord, Lord. <laughs> Took him in the room where Slim see the preacher with a brown skin on each knee. Showed him giant stills going everywhere with a passel of devils struck, stretched dead drunk there. Then he took him to a furnace that some devils was firing hot as hell and Slim started mean perspiring. White devils with pitchforks threw dark devils on. Slim thought he better be getting along. And he say, this makes me think of home. Vicksburg, Little Rock, Jackson, Waco, and Rome. Then the devil gave Slim a big ha-ha and turned into a cracker with a sheriff's star. Slim ran for his wings, lit out for the ground, hauled it back to St. Peter, safety bound, part three. St. Peter said, well, you got back quick. How's the devil and what's his latest trick? And Slim said, Peter, I really can't tell. The place was Dixie that I took for hell. Then Peter say, you must be crazy, I vow. Where in hell do you think hell was? Anyhow, <laughs> get on back to the earth, because I got to fear he's a little too dumb for to stay up here. <laughs> Sterling was a great poet of humor, and of course, uh, humor has this deadly serious side. And he had a whole sequence of poems with this character called Slim Greer. And he got the idea because he was in the barber shops in Jefferson City, uh, Missouri, where he taught, and also, um, he, he, he compiled uh, s several characters. There was a barber in Nashville, very close to Fisk University, who also used to tell these terrific stories. So Sterling made a kind of composite and created a kind of character who was uh, profane, uh, adventurous, dumb in the sense of bringing out or breaking the laws for social convention. Uh, he, has, he has one scene where he um, has um, Slim passing for white and him no darker than a dark midnight. And um, uh, Sterling's um, critiques of the race rituals of the society were things which he had written about in his essays. Uh, he's got a famous one called Negro Characters Seen by White Authors, where he talks about stereotypes in 19th century popular literature. He was an extremely complicated and wise man. And uh, his ability to bring alive uh, in dramatic portraiture, the characters of major people was just extraordinary. This is one of his favorite uh, poems and one that I love. It's called Ma Rainey. When Ma Rainey comes to town, folks from any place miles around from Cape Girardeau and Poplar Bluff flocks in to hear Ma do her stuff. Comes flivering in or riding mules or packed in trains, picnicking fools. That's what it's like for miles on down to New Orleans Delta and Mobile Town when Ma hits anywheres around. They comes to hear Ma Rainey from the Little River settlements, from Black Bottom cornrows and from lumber camps. They stumble in the hall just a laughing and a cackling, cheering like roaring water, like wind and river swamps. And some jokers keeps their laughs a-going in their crowded aisles, and some folks sits there waiting with their aches and miseries, till Ma comes out before them, a smiling gold tooth smiles, and long boy ripples minors on them black and yellow keys. Oh, Ma Rainey, sing your song. Now you back where you belong. Get way inside us. Keep us strong. Oh, Ma Rainey, little and low. Sing us about the hard luck round our door. Sing us about the lonesome road. We must go. I talked to a fella, and the fella say, she just catch hold of us some kind of way. She sang Blackwater Blues one day. It rained for days, and the skies were dark as night. 
trouble taking place in the lowlands at night. Thunder and lightning and the storm begin to roll. Thousands of people ain't got no place to go. Then I went and stood up on some high and lonesome hill and looked down on the place where I used to live. And then the folks, they naturally bowed their heads and cried. Bowed their heavy heads, shut their mouths up tight and cried. And Ma left the stage and followed some folks outside. There wasn't much more, the fella say. She just gets hold of us that away. Wonderful. Of course, he knew Bessie Smith, and he knew the, about the 1927 Mississippi flood. He knew Faulkner. He, um, he knew um, the compromises that what he would call Negro entertainers had to undergo in order to have an access to um, popular culture. And he, he was quick to make a distinction between what he called Tin Pan Alley and real jazz music. And he was an expert on jazz Absolutely. and the blues. And he, knew, he knew the difference between ragtime and Tin Pan Alley. He knew the lyrics, and he satirized people like Irving Berlin and others in a famous poem called Cabaret, which was about uh, a sh Chicago black and tan, 1927, which was at the time of the Mississippi flood. Now, we can't have a program without reference to his remarkable wife, Daisy. And Sterling would read this poem, and he almost couldn't finish it because he started to cry. It's called Conjured. She didn't put her little hands on the back of my head. I can't get away from her till I'm dead. She didn't laid her little body beneath my breast, and I won't never get no rest. She done been in my arms till the break of day. We'll never get away. She done put her little shoes underneath my bed. Never get away from her till I'm dead. Won't want to leave her then, he said. Oh, baby, got to lay so long alone. Lovely love poem. I met Daisy a, t a few times over at uh, Kearney Street, and she came with Sterling when he read at Georgetown a couple of times. And she was very gracious and charming. She was a remarkable woman. Sterling said he was playing tennis in Roanoke, and she walked down the street dragging two kids behind her uh, who were her sister's children. And he said, I looked at this woman and I double faulted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sterling loved this poem, uh, this Washington poem called Putting on Dog. And um, I love to read the poem because it has a dance beat. And Sterling had great rhythm. And he said in one of his talks, uh, my poems are rhythmatical, which is a reference to Louis Armstrong. Armstrong would always say, that man is greatly rhythmatical. <laughs> Sterling had a tremendous sense of humor about all these things putting on dog. Look at old Scrappy putting on dog, putting on dog, putting on dog. Look at old Scrappy putting on dog, stepping like nobody's business. With a brand new silk shirt pink as the sunset, with a pair of suspenders blue as the sky. With bulldog brogans red as a clay road. Pull up, mule wagon, let the mail train by. Look at old Scrappy putting on dog, putting on dog, putting on dog. Look at old Scrappy putting on dog, total on with his Jane. Red back at his wheel with his arm around his baby, heads his old flivver out of the town, and Buck's mad enough to chew a fistful of staples and drink Sloan's liniment to wash him down. <laughs> Look at old Scrappy putting on dog, putting on dog, putting on dog. Look at old Scrappy putting on dog down at Pap Silas's pool room. He's about to use English on the lonesome eight ball, stops short when he hears what Buck has said, winds up like Babe Ruth aiming for a homer, and bends his cue stick around Buck's head. Look at old Scrappy putting on dog, putting on dog, putting on dog. Look at old Scrappy putting on dog, busting rock on the county road. He laughed with his lawyers and he winked at the judge, stuck his fingers up his nose at the jury in the dock, waved goodbye to the gals when they sent him to the work gang, and even had his own way of busting up rock. Look at old Scrappy putting on dog, putting on dog, putting on dog. Look at old Scrappy putting on dog, calling for the bad man Buck. Buck saw him coming, pulled his 3240, got him once in the arm and twice in the side. Scrappy switched his gat like they do it in the Western and let the daylight into Buck's black hide. Look at old Scrappy putting on dog, putting on dog, putting on dog. Look at old Scrappy putting on dog, waiting for the undertaker's wagon. In his box back coat and his mutt leg breeches and a collar high enough for to choke an ox, 
and the girls stopped crying when they saw how Scrappy was a putting on dog in a pine wood box. Oh, you rascal, putting on dog, putting on dog, putting on dog. Oh, you rascal, putting on dog. Great God, but you was a man. <laughs> Michael, I could listen to you read those Sterling Brown poems a lot longer than we have. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you. I do want to take the time before we close to mention that Michael Harper has just uh, edited a book called Every Shut Eye Ain't Asleep. It's an anthology of poetry by African Americans since 1945, and it's dedicated to Sterling Brown. We want to close today with some photographs of Sterling Brown by the photographer Roy Lewis and a special treat uh, Sterling Brown's Howard County poem, one of his most famous poems, After Winter, which we have on tape, read by Sterling Brown. Thank you for joining us on The Writing Life. After Winter. He snuggles his fingers in the blacker loam. The lean months are done with, the fat to come. His eyes are set on a brushwood fire, but his heart is soaring higher and higher. Though he stands ragged, an old scarecrow, this is the way his swift thoughts go. Butter beans for Clara, sugar corn for Grace, and for the little fella, running space. Radishes and lettuce, eggplants and beets, turnips for the winter, and candied sweets. Homespun tobacco, apples in the bin, for smoking and for cider, when the folks traps in. He thinks with the winter, his troubles are gone. 10 acres, unplanted, to raise dreams on. The lean months are done with, the fat to come. His hopes, Winter wanderers, hasten home. Butter beans for Clara, sugar corn for Grace, and for the little fella, running space. <laughs> Thank you.